Daniel chapter 5, if you'll turn there with me. Good to have you in the house, Lord. We're glad that you're with us. Good to have those of you that are streaming with us online. A different time to live, but a great time to live. How many of you are glad that Jesus is still on the throne in all power and majesty and glory and honor? That is for sure. Daniel chapter 5, starting in verse 1, as our ushers receive our second offering. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. And he drank wine in the presence of all of these thousands. I'm dropping down then to verse 4. They drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. The king spoke saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all of the king's wise men came but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. How many of you understand that a astrologers and and those that are involved in the occult how many of you understand that we can't get wisdom from them we get to get our wisdom from the lord and savior jesus christ then king belshazzar was greatly troubled his countenance was changed look at this and his lords they were all astonished turn with me if you would please and look at verse 22 we'll drop down just a little bit verse 22 and so all of a sudden he brings in daniel daniel gives the interpretation of what happened And Daniel begins to speak here in verse 22. But you, his son, King Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart before the Lord, although you knew all of this. And you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all of your ways you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, Mini, mini, tekel, aparzen. This is the interpretation of each word, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tikal, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night... Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, or Babylon, the great empire, was slain and killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. I want to share with you this morning about the handwriting on the wall, because concerning our nation, the handwriting is on the wall, and it's very, very important that we understand and interpret the handwriting that God is writing on the wall to understand the times in which we are living and how vital the body of Christ is during these times. We see that King Belshazzar ruled over the Babylonian Empire at this time. It was an evil, a wicked, and an immoral generation, and they thought they were invincible because of their power. He held a huge party, a huge immoral party with alcohol and girls, etc. They worshiped the false gods and then all of a sudden something happened and the handwriting on the wall came out. God's people, we love our nation. We're a very patriotic church, but the handwriting is also on the wall today. And there are three things the Holy Spirit gave me. I'd like you to write these down if you would, because I believe this is more than a message. I believe this is a word from the Lord, not only for us, but for the body of Christ in the United States of America. And the first thing we need to understand concerning the handwriting on the wall for the United States of America, this is what is being written. Three things. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse is 10 to 18. And let's see what the Lord is writing on the wall concerning our nation. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. We read, and it says this. I'll start in verse 10. Finally, my brothers and sisters in Christ, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against people. We do not wrestle against individuals. We wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, come on, church, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Come on, get your waist girded with truth. Come on, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Come on, get some peace on your shoes. Come on, get the shield of faith on, which you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Come on, church, put on the helmet of salvation. Come on, get out the word of God. Get out the sword of the Spirit and stand. 
start praying as you never have before. Here's the first thing, the handwriting on the wall for the United States of America. The first thing the Lord is writing is this, is that there is a real enemy that is out there. We need to understand who the real enemy is, and we need to understand that we have power and authority over every principality and power. We need to understand that the enemy that we are fighting is not individuals and people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers. And we are fighting the devil, and we are fighting demon forces. You say, Pastor Strayer, I don't believe in that. You better start believing in it, because he is a destroyer, and he has come to kill, destroy, and steal everything from our nation, from you, from the church, from everything he possibly can. There's a real enemy out there. Turn to somebody and say, there's a real enemy out there, and it's the devil and his demon forces. Now... The enemy, I believe, has one main goal right now. The enemy, I believe, has one main goal right now. If I was the enemy, and by the way, I am not, but if I was the enemy, I would do everything I could at this time in the history of mankind to do this. I would get you to change your focus. I would get you to change your focus and put your eyes on the things that are happening on the world instead of putting your eyes on me. Because if you're putting your focus on everything else but the fact that there is an enemy that is trying to destroy our nation, then guess what? You're not going to fight the true enemy that is out there. I got news for you. The true enemy is not blacks and whites and browns and anarchists and politicians. It is powers of hell that are trying to destroy our nation. Can you see Belshazzar eating? Can you see Belshazzar eating? All of a sudden, this hand starts to come out. Do you know what? The same hand is coming out this morning. There is a true enemy that is out there, but we've lost our focus. We have lost our focus. He wants to make you to make the battle personal. He wants you to make the fight personal against people so that you will not focus on the wrong things which are him. The enemy wants you to focus on your spouse and the church and people of another color, the virus, the stuff on TV, the violence that is happening, the mess that our nation is. And if the enemy can get us to focus on everything else but him, you will get the impression that you are fighting for something even though you are re- what you are really doing is fighting for nothing. And the problems in our nation and the problems that exist will will continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse. You say, why? Because we are not fighting against people. We are fighting against powers of hell that have come to steal and kill and destroy. Everyone, refocus on Jesus. Refocus on the fact that there is a real enemy out there, the devil and his demonic pals. They exist and are real, and we can see. You say, how do you know that they're real? We can see the effects of their efforts. Look at the murders that are taking place. Do you realize there were more murders in Chicago, Illinois this past weekend than will occur in all of the nation of Israel for an entire year? Look at all the things that are happening. That three-year-old little boy that was killed as there was a drive-by shooting. Just think of all the murders that are happening out in our nation. Just think of the corruption. I look at the TV and the corruption the hate that is going on, the racial division that is going on. I have a question for all of you, whether it's racial, whether it's in a church, who creates division? I'll tell you who creates division. How many of you know principalities and powers create division? So how do we know that the devil exists? We see the effects. We see corruption. We see the virus. We see division. We see even the church hiding and the church being scared. We are not fighting crime. We are not fighting drugs. We are not fighting the virus. We are not fighting alcohol. We are not fighting the anarchists. We are not fighting politicians. We are not fighting people of different colors. We are not fighting masks or no masks. We are not fighting liberalism. We are not fighting police. We are not fighting prostitution. We are not fighting the looters or the protesters. We are not fighting people, but the powers of hell and the handwriting on the wall tells us that, and we better start using the authority we have in Jesus Christ to come against every principle principality, and power that is trying to destroy our nation. Hello, is anybody here today? Give the Lord praise and glory and honor. Come on 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 the internet. Give the Lord praise and glory and honor today. But the enemy wants to distract us. Oh, he wants to distract us. And he wants to place our focus on everything else but on him. Focus on the Lord, but focus on the fact that there is an enemy. And it's amazing the distraction, how many Christians today are so distracted. They are distracted away from the true enemy that is out there. And he's in the corner, especially laughing at the church of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because we are focusing in on the visible instead of the invisible. We are not in a visible war. We are in an invisible war that you cannot see. 
There is a virus out there that is invisible that is infecting a lot of people. There are demon forces that you can't see, but guess what? They are out there, but guess what? They are invisible. But how many of you are glad that Jesus has given us as born-again believers all authority over every power of hell concerning sickness? Come on, concerning our nation. Come on, concerning hatred and division. Can you say amen? We need to understand the enemy wants to distract us and place our focus on everything else but on him. That your issues, our nation's issues, actually originate with people or anyone else but him. He wants you to focus on the visible instead of the invisible where all of the action is really taking place. If I was the enemy, and again, I am not, I would get all of you to focus on people. I would get all of you to focus on somebody of a different color. I would get all of you to focus on other individuals, the anarchists and the looters and the protesters, anything, whether they're doing right or doing wrong, because guess what? It would take your mind completely off of me. And if I was the enemy, I would want your mind completely off of me that you would fight one another and you would fight people of different colors and you would get mad at the protesters and you would get mad at the anarchists. Guess what you have allowed that to happen? That me as an enemy, I can go out and keep destroying and keep tearing down and keep making our nation worse than it ever is. You know why? Because you're not worried about me. You're not thinking about me. You're not focusing about me. But can we refocus today? Can we focus on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And can we also refocus on the fact that there is an enemy, come on, who is trying to destroy our nation, but we are not going to allow it to happen. Come on, born-again believers, rise up in this last day. Use your authority in Jesus Christ. Come against the principalities and powers. Stand your ground in Jesus' name, and let's see God do some great things in our nation. Come on, everybody give the Lord praise. Would you do that? Would you do that? Two things I would like you to write down, please. Write these two things down. Number one is this. Use your time and your energy on the real enemy. Use your time and the energy on your energy on the real enemy. I'm saying things this morning that you all know, but I know that God is hitting your heart. And I know he is hitting your spirit. Listen to the voice of the Lord this morning, not me. The devil and demons are ferocious. They are killers. You are looking at the greatest nation that has ever existed. They are trying to destroy our nation. They are trying to destroy the body of Christ worldwide. They will use any method. They will use anything possible to do that. And please understand, your social media post will not change that. It will not do anything. It will not do one thing to stop the ferociousness of the powers of hell. Who is right or who is wrong on the virus and on wearing masks and taking vaccines and people getting angry by what they watch on TV and conversations and legislations and elections and change? Talk about all of that, but it will not do one thing to come against the ferociousness of the enemy that we are fighting. God's people, put your energy, put your efforts, put your time, put your prayers in the fact that there are powers of hell that are out there. But how many of you are glad if we will just join together where to agree as touching anything, we can push back the powers of darkness in Jesus' name. Number two, number two, do not lose your fight. Turn to somebody, look them in the eye, say, don't lose your fight. Don't lose your fight. Don't lose your fight. Two things we need to understand about what is going on with this virus. Do not lose your fight. There was a practical fight and there was a spiritual fight. Let me give you an example. How many of you know if you want to go out and get a job, you just don't sit at home and pray about it? How many of you know you go out and you go on an interview and you get on the Internet and you fill out all the applications? My son lives out in Denver. He says, uh, Dad, I need a job. Get on the Internet and put in 100 applications. God will give you one out of those, and he surely did. How many of you know the Lord provides all of our needs? But you've got to do something about it. So there was a practical fight. What do you mean a practical fight? With this virus, how many of you understand you've got to wash your hands? No hugs. Mm -mm, I only hug my wife. There's no hugs. You know, that's hard for the church, for the church of Jesus Christ, for no hugs. But you don't go around hugging people right now. How many of you understand that you don't shake hands with individuals right now? You just don't do that because that's where most of the viruses and sickness comes. What does it come from? You shake somebody's hand, and then you touch your face. 
That's what occurs. That's why we have not had much sickness in the Strayer household, not just because of the promises of God. Ever since Susie and I got married, if you come into our house, shake your hands or leave the house. Come on, you got to to wash your hands or you got to leave the house. Wash those hands. You got to wash those hands. Even when my kids come over, you got to wash their hands. We hardly have sickness at all. That's why when we were parents and we had little kids and they might get a little sick, we had to be careful. We'd wash their hands because you put their hands all over your face, etc. How many of you understand there's a lot of practical things that you have to do? I know everybody's saying stay inside that's the worst thing you can do go outside and get in the sun that burns off a lot of that sickness that is there I do that every day take your vitamin C do the practical things and guess what you will not get the virus you do not get the virus by coming to church you get the virus by shaking somebody's hands and hugging them putting your hands on your face and slobbering all over everybody quit slobbering on the people that are around you and you won't get the virus at all you got to do the practical things you can't lose your fight but how many of you understand you also have to do the spiritual things you have to do the spiritual things God's people if you lose if you lose your fight the enemy will steal everything from you he is a thief he has come to kill he has come to to steal, and he has come to destroy him. And I know a lot of born-again believers during this time, because of all the things that are going on, they are losing their fight. They are losing their faith. They're losing their fire. They're losing their cutting edge. They're losing their zeal. They're losing their passion. They're losing their purpose. They're losing their belief in God's abilities. I don't know about you, but when the enemy comes in and tries to steal my marriage, guess what? He is not going to steal my marriage. How many of you know you got to pray every day for your marriage? you got to fight? How if you know you got to pray every day that your kids won't fall away from the Lord, but you got to believe God to shake them and stir them and do a work in them. Guess what? When this virus comes your way, guess what you got to do? You got to fight. You got to come against principalities and powers. You got to come against powers of hell. You got to stand up and say, In the name of Jesus, you're not going to steal my health. You're not going to steal my finances. You're not going to steal my victory. You're not going to steal my joy. Come on. You're not going to steal my marriage. You're not going to steal my kids. Come on. Get up and begin to fight a little bit. Fight a little bit. Fight a little bit. Turn to somebody and say, don't lose your fight. Don't lose your fight. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. So that's the first thing, the handwriting on the wall. The handwriting on the wall for the United States of America. The second thing that the handwriting on the wall is, I have three of them. I'll give them to you. Write it down. Number one, number one, we need to make sure and we need to understand. We need to understand that there is a real enemy out there. Turn to somebody and say there's a real enemy out there, and it's not the pastor. It's not the pastor. Number two, we need to understand here the handwriting on the wall. We need to understand that the Lord is in the moving business. The Lord is in the moving business. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Here in Newport Ritchie, I'm sure you see it all over, the place uh, concerning moving, two men in a truck. Isn't that unbelievable, that company? They're all over the place, two men in a truck. When they're moving, a lot of people use two men in a truck. I'll never forget when we were moving down here to Florida. We moved from Bluffton, Indiana. It was I'll never forget it. January 26th, it was 26 degrees below zero. We had a moving company move it. It's one of the smartest things I've ever done in my life. Didn't have the money to afford it, but it was one of the smartest things to do. They packed it up. They loaded it up. They drove it all the way down to Florida. I remember it was minus 26 degrees when we came down into Florida. Guess what it was here? It was 55 degrees. We rolled down our windows. We went to the motel. We went swimming that day. We were driving around waving for people. We didn't know what was going on. Everybody down here had coats on. They had muffs on. They had mittens on. Man, it was 70 degrees warmer down here in Florida. But you know what? There's two men in a truck. There's moving vans. There's moving companies. But I got some great news for you. The Lord is in the moving business. The handwriting is on the wall, and the Lord is in the moving business. The Lord moved Noah and his family and every toque of a kind animal from the earth in a boat to keep civilization going. So he took Noah, he took his family, and two of every kind of animal that lived on earth, put them all in a boat, and kept civilization going. And do you realize the ark had one door because there's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. But do you also realize that the ark only had one window? You know why? Because the only thing that Noah could do was not look out at the rain and everything. He could only look up and look into the sky. He could only look up and see that Jesus is good, and Jesus is wonderful, and Jesus is going to get them through. Come on, would you get your eyes on the window of heaven and know that the Lord's going to bring you through and everything's going to be okay. The Lord moved Abraham and his family from idolatry. 
his family, his home, his job, and he moved him and he t- took him to Israel. And do you realize that Abraham became the first Jew and was saved? The Lord moved Israel and Moses out of Egypt into the promised land after 400 years of bondage. Oh, he's in the moving business. The Lord moved his people from inside of a building in Acts chapter 2 to the outside of the building where people could get saved and born again. Because how many of you know he doesn't want the church to be inward? He wants the church to be outward. The Lord moved people out of sin and into freedom through the resurrection and the cross. How many of you are glad that the Lord moved you and is in the moving business, took you out of sin and brought you into victory in the Lord through his blood? And the Lord moved. He's in the moving business. And there was one more big move that is going to happen concerning a huge group of people because God's people, I'll tell you this, if you don't know it, something's up. Something is getting ready to happen. You say, what's the next great move of God? Not the revival in the United States of America, the rapture of the church of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. But I do not want you not to understand what is going on, brothers and sisters in Christ, concerning those who have already died in the faith, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, does anybody here believe that Jesus died and rose again? If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have died in Jesus. For this we say to you, look at this, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, hello, that's us, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have already died in the Lord. For the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. There is going to be the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You say, what is this referring to? This is referring to the catching away of the church. The word rapture means to be taken and caught away in a state of joy and great ecstasy. One of these days, soon, that trumpet's going to sound. There's going to be the voice of the Lord. And please understand what the Lord is saying here. Every sign has taken place for the rapture to occur. We are the first generation that has seen every sign that has to take place for the rapture to take place. We are the only generation, I want to say it again, that has seen all the signs taking place that the rapture could possibly take place. Should I say it one more time? We are the only generation and group of people that have seen all the signs taking place that need to take place before the rapture of the church happens. And then one of these days, the Lord in his moving business, two men in a truck. He's going to come down and guess what he's going to do? He's going to take up every born again believer. He's going to take them by the nap of the neck. He's going to transport every born again believer. Even if you live in Reykjavik, Iceland, even if there's only one Christian, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter what color you are, who you are, how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter whether the church exists or not. He's going to look around for all of his born again believers and he's going to say, come up here and everybody who's born again through the blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to be with the Lord forever, 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 and he's going to pull us out of this mess. Is anybody glad that he's in the moving business? And here's the third one and the last one. Please write this down if you would, please. Second Thessalonians, would you turn there with me? Second Thessalonians, just turn turn your flicker on the right and head to chapter 2. The handwriting is on the wall, and here is something else that is being written. Number three. It's time for the restrainers to start restraining. It's time for the restrainers to start restraining. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you to not be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. So do you notice Apostle Paul says here, born-again believers, do not be troubled. What does that mean? Do not be alarmed. Do not be frightened. Do not be shocked. Do not be agitated. God's people, there is not a vaccine yet for the virus, but there is a known vaccine for fear. And the known vaccine for fear is faith. 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 
Pastor, I don't know if I'm going to make it. By faith, oh, yes, I am going to make it. The Lord's going to take me through the flood. The Lord's going to take me through the fire. The Lord's going to provide my every need. The Lord's going to come through for me. The Lord's going to bring healing. Even if I get the virus, he's going to raise me up. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to take care of us. I will not walk in fear. I will not walk in anxiety. Hello, anybody here? I will not walk in discouragement. I will not hide in my home. I will trust in the Lord. Come on, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll come through for you. Please remember, always go by facts. I'm not a medical doctor. We are a church. But remember, even though there's a lot of cases out there right now, the death rate is still going down and down and down. It's less than it ever was. So you need to get the facts that are out there. Things are happening, but how many of you are glad that we can overcome fear through faith? So he says here, do not be troubled. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining. Everybody say restraining. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he be taken out of the way. And then the Antichrist, the lawless one, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Who is this restraining force? The restraining force, are you ready, is the body of Christ. And the Bible says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that we as restrainers need to get restraining. And how in the world do we restrain the forces of evil here on planet earth? Through prayer, through crying out in prayer, through seeking the Lord. Listen, even if you are staying home today and you are watching the uh, service online, that is wonderful. But take a good hour of prayer today and begin to restrain the powers of hell that are trying to destroy our nation. The word restrain means to hold back, and then the word restrain means to push back. Pastor, the enemy is really coming against my family. Well, quit whining about it. Whining will not do one thing at all. How many of you know you got to get on your knees? You got to cry out to the Lord. You got to put your hands on the enemy. You got to hold him back. And then you've got to push him back and push him back and push him back. Guess what? We can push the enemy right into the Atlantic Ocean. Come on, push the enemy out of your family. Push the enemy out of your church. Push the enemy out of your community. Push the enemy out of your nation. It is only through prayer. So the restrainers, guess what they have to start doing? They've got to start restraining. This is the day to pray more than we have ever prayed before. And then one of these days, the restraining force, did you notice what it said in verse 7? The restraining force, look at this, he is going to be taken out of the way. What is that? The church is going to be removed through the rapture. I had somebody Facebook me, it was a couple days ago. They say, Pastor, it's really bad out there. I said, no, it's not. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I said, oh, it's bad, but guess what? You ain't seen nothing yet. And they said, what are you talking about? The reason it is bad but not so bad is because the church is still present. How many of you understand our nation needs to thank God that the church of Jesus Christ is still here? Come on, everybody give the Lord praise. We need to be thankful that we're still here. You say, why? We're the ones who are pushing back the powers of hell. We're the ones who are restraining the powers of hell. And if you think it's bad now, when the church is taken out of here, all hell is going to break loose on planet Earth because the restraining force will be gone. So guess what we can do now? There is victory for our nation if the restrainers will begin to restrain. That's why we put all of our pro corporate prayer meetings now are also on Facebook Live. So nobody who attends CCWC has an excuse that they cannot come to a corporate prayer meeting, whether there's a virus or there was a not a virus. How many of you know you can get online Sunday morning? You can get online Tuesday at noon. You can get online during the week, and you can pray, and you can seek the face of the Lord. And how many of you are glad that we can not only hold back the powers of darkness, but we can push them back and push them back and push them back, and we can see healing come to our nation and come to our land. Come on, restrainers. Get restraining. Get restraining. Don't be discouraged. Don't be down. Begin to pray, and keep on praying in Jesus' name. 